welcome back to 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 map camp uh this is our third session in this particular track today the the archway window um just a reminder to everybody the format uh we have three speakers uh, each will speak for 15 minutes and then we'll have a 15 minute discussion about the talk then the next speaker will go for 15 minutes 15 minute discussion 15 15 and that gives us an hour and a half in total um now when we have the discussion, of course, the other speakers will be asking the first speaker, uh, the, other, the one who's just spoken about their talk. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to put in questions. And so there is a Q&A button uh, at the bottom uh, on your Zoom. Please put your questions in there and I'll pick them up and ask those questions. Now, we've got three fabulous speakers. Uh, one leads digital transformation at DEFRA. They're the people who basically keep you fed. Uh, one leads digital transformation at the police. Uh, they're the people who keep you safe. And one just happens to be a G20 UN advisor and a science diplomat. So, you know, uh, no big deal. Uh, three fabulous uh, speakers, but I'm not going to tell you who's who. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, and the running order today is Dr. Jackie Taylor, then Tracy Green, and then Simon Clifford. So let's start there. Um, Start with Jackie. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there. So I'm Dr. Jackie Taylor and I am CEO and co-founder of Flying Binary. We're a web science company. We're focused on inclusion and by that I mean we leave no one behind and we're changing the world to leverage the industrial internet of things with deep tech. Do I go to, into my presentation now, Simon? Oh, no, let's do a quick oh. introduction of everyone. Oh, okay. Don't worry, Jackie, but leave the slide there. Oh, oh yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, so, Jackie, you're also the G20 UN advisor, aren't you? I am indeed. Indeed. Uh, and, so, and a newly appointed expert advisor to the European Commission. Oh. Uh, we now have our post-Brexit roles. <laughs> You've got all the badges. So... <laughs> <laughs> Next yeah. up is 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 Trace uh, is Tracy Green. Hello, Tracy. Hi, Simon. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Good to be here. Uh, my name is Tracy Green, and my role at the moment is I'm working at DEFRA, leading uh, as program delivery lead for the Future Farming program, which is all about putting in place new arrangements with farmers and land managers in England as we leave the European Union. Basically keeping us fed. And, so, <laughs> and last, by, but by the power of deduction, uh, uh, last, Mr Clifford, you must be the police. Indeed, yes. Uh, my name's Simon Clifford. I'm Director of Digital Data at the Police ICT Company, uh, which is a, a specialist arm of uh, uh, policing working across all UK law enforcement uh, um, forces. And you're very welcome. In fact, you're all welcome here. So, as I said, the format is 15 minutes, 15 minute discussion. First up is Jackie. So I'm going to throw the ball over to Jackie and away you go. Jackie, I think you're on mute, by the way. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Excellent. Good news. Um, so I want to talk about the global agenda and the reboot that we've just been doing. Oh, Jackie, um, yeah. just, just to tell you what I can see on your screen is it says next to working from home, here are some tips to help you meet like a pro. Doesn't no. seem to be your slides. No, that's not my slides. Bear okay, with me. no Let problem. Me try again. That's not a problem at all. Uh, we're all getting used to uh, living in this uh, in this new world. Oh, that, perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. All good. Okay. All right. Bear with me. Start my video again. Okay, then. So um, I want to talk about the way in which we deliver our te deep technology. And uh, just to frame what I'm talking about, we're a cloud-only uh, service provider. We utilize public cloud, but we build private cloud provision from the tin up, no reliance on the EU US privacy shield, if anybody knows about the Schrems II decision. And we have to do this this way because it enables us to meet the legal and regulatory jurisdictions 
for the countries where we deploy our services. Now, last year at Map Camp, I spoke about the need for intelligent leader leadership, deliberately prov provocative, do that, then what happens is I've been given the opportunity to put that in place for 180 nations. And Simon was talking before we came on here about what sort of budget levels we're working at. So uh, $131 trillion is the, is the overall budget for that. And I'll talk a little bit about the detail and how we got to there. But first of all, I want to give you a, a quick overview on Flying Binary, so you know who we are, what we do. We're international web scientists. We're also co-founders of the data journalism industry and 34 million citizens across the world participate in our cutting edge research. I want to frame the industrial internet of things as an engineering challenge because it is. Both co-founders at Flying Binary are engineers, but it has a societal in impact. So it's a technology um, enabled change, but it has quite a different uh, impact on our world. And um, we focused originally in the build of our company on unlocking the talents of Generation Z. Gen Z are 27 to 17 today, and they influence 40% of the economic power in uh, 2020. Got any Gen Z in your organizations? Look after them. Any Gen Z out there? Hi there. Um, but our work for, for you all and for them is done. And uh, at Davos in 2019, I announced that we were moving all of our um, builds to Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha are 16 to 6, but James does insist in, in making me say that he's 4. Um, so Gen Beta is, is, all, is around the corner anyway. And that's our new focus for the inclusion agenda that we deliver. And then the other context that will set what I'm going to say is we're delighted to be one of the 22 suppliers who've been awarded to supply service AI services, artificial intelligence services to Her Majesty's government. Clearing up a bunch of questions from last year, I'm very sorry for everybody that had to go and find me about this. Deep tech, what on earth is it? Uh, the term comes from Strachey Jatavardi, who's a co-founder and CEO of the investment firm uh, Propel. Deep tech companies are based on substantial scientific advances, the foundational web science we've created in our case, and high tech engineering innovation. Um, they require, uh, as deep tech requires lengthy R&D, usually a long time to reach commercial applications and often large investments for commercial success. The key thing is though, the underlying IP of deep tech is usually well protected, hard to reproduce, and it gives us all a strong competitive advantage and is indeed a barrier to entry. Now, Flying Binary is the exception on both those counts. We've never taken investments since we came out of stealth 10 years ago, and we've been profitable since, from mo since month one. And the pioneering web science we've done are the, uh, is the basis of the architecture um, and deployments we've done of our sustainable cloud services. So hopefully that clears it up, but I'll be around at the end of the network and if you've still got questions about it. So last year, I actually showed you the Wardley map for the landscape of smart cities where intelligent leadership began. Um, and I used this as the base set of mapping to take um, the reboot for the G20 digital economies. G20 is 60% of the world's GDP. And, and essentially we've got a collaborative effort which happens every year. I was involved in um, the 2018-19 effort and then this year very formally um, on that. And this was the, this is also the map that we used as our baseline start point for the European Next Steps Agenda, which I will describe. So the G20 plan I created for the Digital Economy Task Force is beyond industrial internet of things, but it generates a growth agenda. I was able to put 4.4% uh, growth for the future digital economies, utilizing deep tech at the core and um, serving the smart city domain because one area of focus that the G20 were very interested in, you'll know for the changes in the, in the um, responses we've had during the pandemic was the critical national infrastructure. The UK is the only country in the world that's recognized those requirements for future economy. And part of my G20 plan was to address that gap for the other members. And it turns out that plan uh, was a COVID plan. And so what happened next was I was appointed an expert advisor to the United Nations to sort it out for everybody else. Not as simple as they thought. But essentially that um, plan for the UN that I'm currently constructing with the rest of the team um, is a 2030 plan. So everybody's moving beyond the Paris Agreement to look to the 2030 horizon around the 17 sustainable development goals. Hopefully you all seen those before. <clears throat> but this focus for the 2030 plan is not just the primary goals, but the delivery secondary goals too. 
Now, one of the UN agencies, U4SSC, is actually um, mandated to use smart cities as a delivery model. And we had to choose an intervention. Um, we did that with maps, but um, the intervention we've chosen is procurement as the key focus. So where will you start? We'll start with the budget, as I said, $131 trillion. And having been involved in the creation of a, of a, a cloud first policy in the UK, as part of the G Cloud Zero team, I've now actually got the opportunity to widen the agenda beyond cloud and deliver those benefits of an inclusion agenda to 180 countries. It's hugely exciting, but of course, what's, what's created in G20 stays there. And for now, what's created in the UN stays there. But I've got something just as exciting to share with you, and there's maps. Um, I've been doing the research work with the uh, Leading Edge Forum, Forum to find the signals for the next generation table that you're probably all familiar with. So hopefully you can see this um, uh, and this is not unfamiliar to you. So it would be great if there was a way of, of let me know whether this is something you've looked at, whether it's something that you that you utilize, whether it's actually something that drives um, your direction. It certainly is what we do at um, Fly Binary. But I first saw it during a heated cloud debate when I realized I was talking next gen and the panel was talking traditional and I was waving a red card around and Simon hauled me up there. So when he hands you a red card, use it wisely is what I'd say. So I'm sure you'll love this table already, but I'm telling you it's time to change it. It's nearly 10 years, how is, how is that possible? So the uh, LEF have convened research group to find the signals for the next gen, the 10 years on, and I'm on the government thread. So meet the team. You know at least two of us, and um, I'm hoping Steve's actually in the audience I'm, and, and ping me if you are. Um, so this is, um, I was the first technologist to create a data service across the entire NHS estate in 1994. And given, given the recent missing COVID test results, it would appear mo not much has changed since then. But as you might imagine, the time of this research, I think has been almost prophetic for the government thread not pathetic, prophetic, as we started the work just as the pandemic hit. And I've been able to contribute my G20 and my UN work because I've been able to fold that into this. And, and since your, last year's map camp informed that, that work. And in the government team, we focused on the UK government. We've taken some signals from the US and from uh, Canada because there's some synergies with the, with the state of the nation stuff. But and, and what I would say to the rest of the team, you included Simon, I've changed some of this. So you've not seen all of this either because I'm protecting the innocent, but also I'm building the story. So if some of it doesn't look like what you saw, that's because I changed it. And um, so the, the basis of our work in the government thread is we, and this is what we've used as a framework for the work we've done throughout. And there's a little bit in the top right, left hand corner that says UK values. In our view, as the government team, this is what we've, we've built the framework from. And what we've done is questioned whether we'll need to change this now, not just as a result of Brexit, which we would have questioned it on anyway, but as a result of the responses we've had to the pandemic. But if we look at government in a bit more detail, we formed essentially this baseline hierarchy of needs to look at both the activity and the practice across government. And in some cases, you can see specific departments, I've called it UK ministry because that's what they used to be called. Um, but some cases, um, such as education and health, it's covered by a whole range of, of bodies, uh, departments, agencies. So, but it was this chart we used to explore the various aspects of the hierarchy and needs that government needs to look, look to. And it proved really difficult to see the signals for the next gen uh, work. So the clearest way was to look at health because health was um, under siege with the pa pandemic and therefore everything was being, um, was being sort of re-evaluated. And so where we started with, and I think this is a good piece of work, I've done this um, at G20, I'm starting to do this at, at the UN as well, looking at the things that you use as principles. So in, in the NHS for England, uh, the, these are declared principles, but actually look at values as well. So the principles have actually been created by the NHS itself. And essentially this is the NHS's constitution. So if you look from a government hierarchy needs to this constitution, the question we asked was, has the pandemic disproved and, or questioned these principles? 
resounding yes to that. We also examine the values of the NHS. These values are common ground. These are the basis values on the basis on which collaboration is achieved for what I would call shared aspiration. And it actually should underpin everything the NHS in England does. So the simply, this is a simplified view of how you unpick this whole thing and look at how you might have um, changes. And I, in our, the re, this is the results of our investigations prior to actually getting some, some overview of the pandemic, but it brought together the hierarchy of needs and the values and the principles, hugely complex area. And it needed, we understood when we were trying to pull this together as a team, a specific understanding on the impact of COVID itself. So brace yourself. Um, I've spent at least an hour explaining this in this context and taking two hours of questions, but don't panic, that's not now. In essence, we were able to show that the pandemic has impacted every part of the NHS. And the 11 key areas of change that I have on this overview um, show that all the NHS values and in fact the principles have been impacted. And of course, what we needed next was detailed user journeys for the main care pathways, no time to go into that today. However, we were able to map the results into a new COVID-19 journey from the patient's perspective, of course, which is a key point. Essentially, COVID has achieved something that I've never witnessed before, even though my technologists have put change across the entire service, it's achieved an evolution. In essence, prior to COVID, the NHS has a transactional approach to healthcare. Um, the uh, Secretary of State is, uh, is famous for saying the National Hospital Service. And um, that is resulting in technology that manages the service, not the patient. For the first time, a patient centric journeys emerged with some really important results. This map takes some time to go through, but primary care is essentially being bypassed with COVID. Um, and that's your GP services because it's being administered across the primary care for COVID is being administered across public and private services and across government capabilities being created, which has al allowed us to examine the sort of the wider landscape and health at, at the center of the setting. And, and one example we have of that, one really clear example is the operational services that have been provided by the Ministry of Defense to set up Nightingale hospitals, uh, which are currently, they're currently being stood up again. So that's a capability that the, that the health service now has, which is not provided by the health service. Although this time they may well be stood up by Public Health England, but the emerging practice has uh, signalled a change with local testing capabilities, which you could build upon to drive multidisciplinary care, no shortage of ambition in our group. And so we take it from a transactional service to a possibility of multidisciplinary care, which is patient centric. So what's next? Well, for me, you'll have to wait until Simon says you can see what's next, because he's in charge of saying, what happens next? But it, it's coming, 2021, no date that I've been given. Um, but I'll end where I began. The G20 team from Europe was, was with me when I created the, the global G20 plan. I've been appointed as a European expert to shape the next policy agenda for the next seven years. The transition has been though, and this is a really clear thing from a UK point of view, We've built what we've done for the last 10 years on user needs, but for an inclusion agenda, that's what we're actually pushing forward with for Europe. And the policy agenda has been created to deliver the UN 2030 plan. Uh, the delivery model is not smart cities though. So this might be the very last time that, um, that I'll talk about smart cities. We're gonna go for sustainable communities. This was ratified by European Council in July, of course, without the UK, because we're no longer a member. So the EU is the first G20 member to deliver a policy agenda on the basis of a future digital economy. And the report I authored with three other European experts are the recommendations for that policy plan, focused on inclusion, not user needs. And essentially the overarching mission is to improve the health and wellbeing outcomes for 500 million citizens. So I'll be busy. Um, and I think the, the reality of it is, in summary, the future digital economies have had a reboot from a user need perspective to an inclusion agenda. Thanks for listening. Look forward to your questions and discussion with Simon and Tracy. Wow, wow. <laughs> Where do we start? I mean, um, on one side, you're talking about the shift of the NHS uh, from trans transactional to, to people-centric. Uh, another side, you're talking about the change of practices. 
that are appearing in the sort of next generation organization. The table that you showed was the 2010 table where we highlighted there, there are certain new practices that were emerging. And of course, we're doing the research now uh, to look at what are the new practices emerging um, for the next 10 years, of which that research has 11 tracks, of which one is government. Um, and of course, in that exploration, you're, you're mapping out the whole of uh, government. And so we've got into mapping values and principles and COVID is impacting, you know, you know, at those, those values, those, those beliefs that we have, as well as uh, the universally useful principles are enabling others to appear. So, so these are massive subjects. And then you just casually throw in uh, the work <laughs> that you're doing in terms of uh, the G20, which is 60% of the world's GDP and, and uh, about 130. I was brought on board to look at the, well, how do we take this to a UN level? You can't use the same plan. Um, but what you can do is look at the interventions of what connects the same plan, the growth plan that underpins G20. And so essentially, uh, the first thing I always do, anybody who knows me, what I've done in the UK is get, get my hands on the money so that we can redistribute the money. So things we need to do. So the first thing was, what's the budget? And that's the budget, $131 trillion. Wow. That's, that's, um, that's just huge figures, mind boggling. Now, I, I'm going to bring in uh, Tracy and Simon in a minute to, to ask you some questions, but we've already got some coming in from uh, the audience. So let's uh, go and pick one. This one's from Charles Newhouse. Um, do you see the NHS change you speak of sticking or is it a, um, a transitory side effect? Do you think the NHS has the sort of situational visibility to recognise the change and potential? No. No, there we are. No, I, I, so I've done, uh, do, I've you, done, do you want to expand? <laughs> well, I've done transformational. I'm the only technology that's done transformational change of this nature in the NHS before. And so I know what it takes and I know it's not positioned. It's actually positioned in a worse way than it was in uh, 1994. So, yes, you can look at it the way we did, it did and you can look at the landscape of it and you can look at where it needs to change. And that COVID map that exploded on you, um, the, the work that underpins that is huge. But the essence of, of what you need to change is on that one slide. Mm. Um, but, but out of it all, whatever happens, unless the NHS takes a patient centric and not a transactional journey, which is what that whole research piece has shown is possible with COVID, then it won't change. But there are, you know, there are groups of people within the NHS and NHS Wales, for example, who are mapping and trying to understand the landscape as well. So there are already people in there doing that sort of thing. Have you have you come across them in your journeys or? Yeah, I have done. And I think people are doing excellent work. And I don't mean to in any way decry that, but it needs a strategic intervention at national level, because as I know as smart cities are, you cannot take any of this in isolation. Each of the home nations has its own needs. Each of the cities within that and communities, as we're now calling them in Europe, actually have their own needs too. There's only one thing that connects every smart city in the world. They're all different. That includes mm. all the 650 in China. So, so actually, unless we see it at the blue sky level and at the detail level, and at the moment, there's no way to connect those two agendas. I mean, I've obviously started at the top, uh, nation states across G20 and then UN, but we should be able to connect these agendas. And what, the, what it's done at G20 is focus our attention. So I was able to deliver an inclusion agenda and 4.4% growth as a result. I would, uh, would say that for the NHS to really change, it needs to understand what it's diverting its mission to. Obviously patient-centric inclusion would be my view, but, but on the basis of what? And then that would need to be articulated. But the essence of it is in that, that hugely complicated COVID map. So, so um, I know from the stuff that I did with Mark and uh, also the UN, where he went, they went from basically reducing global poverty all the way down to the need for all weather roads, all the way down to the different national statistics organizations, all, way, all the way down to the survey systems. You can connect all of this with, in a map. Of course, he's going to be terribly, as I said, terribly gutted about only saving 100 billion. Um, so, so at this note, I'm going to say, Simon, Tracy, do, 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 do you have any questions you want to dive in and ask? Simon. 
Yeah, I mean, so, so, uh, certainly the the point about the the disconnect, and that's something that uh, you know that I've uh, I've been looking at in terms of uh, being able to sort of map uh, independent um, uh, uh, health authorities. Certainly, where you've got mapping, sort of the genesis of mapping actually beginning to be applied, and how you can connect that and correlate that. Because yeah. certainly, I'll be talking about that in a, li in a little while in terms of getting sort of industrial scale mapping, so we can connect. Uh, people independently doing maps to give us a holistic picture has yeah. that ha, have you started to expose that as a conversation well it turns out no because it because the plan for the g20 actually turned out to be a covid plan we've been able to get going and so the national uh, settings for the policy interventions are already being created i gave you the european one because that's the only one in the public domain but essentially we have actually started there um, originally looking at um, some of the intricacies let's say of deep tech because it, it it really does create a different societal impact and i've been a part of the european team to explore that but now widening it across all the 500 million citizens so we've taken that inclusion agenda for example with the new uh, European directive that's just live or just mandated for accessibility we have 800 million of those 500 million citizens that we've got to do specific interventions with so what do you do you assemble a, a team of 6,700 mayors 95,000 cities across Europe ready to rumble ready to go and then rewire the entire European Commission and so essentially we are already in that policy landscape and creating that. Wow. Tracy, did you did you want to come in? Yeah, those maps were amazing, Jackie. I'm I'm just kind of as somebody con continually learning how to do this and to use this approach effectively. I'm kind of really interested in the relationship between that kind of macro view of everything that you've got there and the detail lower down, because one of the challenges we're we're having in DEFRA is, is the mapping between those two perspectives, if you like. So, um, I suppose my question is. How, how, how did that how did that come about that kind of macro view um, well there was already a macro view because the 2018 19 g20 which was uh, presidency was japan i'd already done the societal changes as part of that um but that did not translate to the national interventions that were required for the rest of the g20 so in this presidency it was to look at how you would reset it around common goals and the UN SDGs are just a given because the future of business, the future of our digital economies are in the cities or in the communities. And so we knew we had a setting, but quite frankly, it's to do the bottom up, it's to do the top down, but then I have a means of getting the data to check it. So I was able to consult with 2 million citizens whilst we were doing that work to double check what we were finding. And it turns out that 40,000 of those Gen Z actually knew some of the answers to the questions we didn't know to ask. Because I can connect our tech to every person on the planet and ask a series of wicked questions, which comes from our security role. And so actually some of this is a mismatch when you try and do it, but th so we've got a sense making element to it. And then we have an AI um, service that trains across 2 billion data points every day that allows us to actually um, understand that federation of change. So th it's a series of interventions, um, but the G20 deploy all this at nation state level, not as a G20. It's a collaboration across the nations, but then the changes happen in country. So, and Europe is the first one to move forward with that orchestrated plan that you're talking about. And so it's complicated, but it's the stuff I love. And, um, and, and you know me well enough to know that I have the data. <laughs> now on that note, uh, I, I suppose because we've got uh, um, uh, two other speakers, uh, I, it's next in our order is Tracy. So uh, let me take the ball and throw it over to Tracy. Thanks, Simon. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen there. Yeah, perfect. A green screen for somebody coming from DEFRA. Um, I've already introduced myself, so um, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is to be here. I happen to be here on behalf of my programme director, Janet Hughes, who's decided very sensibly to take the week off. Um, so I've come to talk about really um, what we're doing around mapping our programme, the Future Farming programme. Um, so I'm excited for two reasons today as well. One is um, obviously to be at MAP Camp. It's actually the first time I've 
been at map camp um, but secondly I became a grandmother yesterday and I've, I've got to share that with everybody on the call my new granddaughter Catherine Grace was born uh, yesterday weighing in at um, seven pounds and nine ounces so um, double excitement for me today. Um, so just to go back to what I'm going to talk about, I've called this this presentation a view from the front line because we are right in the midst of mapping in DEFRA. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the culture of maps and mapping in, in, in that government department and how we're using that to, to try and frame our programme and think about the, the really big decisions that we have to make over the next few months that are going to set a path to the future, um, that set out what that relationship is going to be between government, farmers, food producers um, and uh, other associated bodies. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you very much what we're doing now. We're, we're on a, a learning curve in the organisation. We're starting to do some of this. So I'm going to be giving you a bit of an inside track on some of that. But first, a bit of a confession. Um, so I've been a long time fan of mapping, even though I haven't managed to make it along to map camp. I first met Simon about, I think it's about five years ago now, Simon. Um, I came along to one of the mapping parties you did at Microsoft, where we were um, uh, mapping out the value chain of making a cup of tea on the wall um, and really learning about how, how to do all of that. And then I think I, you, you came and spent some time with us in Parliament, um, where I was working at the time. And we started to think about how we might map that kind of complex um, area. Um, I didn't manage to find any photo of a, photos of us doing that, but uh, I did manage to find the ticket and the, um, the kind of map that we started to do there in Parliament. So from Parliament, I've gone to uh, work in DEFRA, as was mentioned, um, and I'm the programme delivery lead, lead there for the Future Farming and Countryside programme, which is a massive programme. It's got a big, long trajectory over the next eight years to kind of change the way government engages with farmers and helps to um, promote and, and uh, uh, the natural environment. But the, the, the role of DEFRA in government is all about safeguarding our natural environment, supporting our world leading food and farming industry and sustaining a thrive, thriving rural economy. So you can see in that statement there, there's, there's quite a lot of tensions, particularly be between the idea of producing food but also sustain, safeguarding our natural environment and delivering really positive outcomes for the environment around things like um, clean air and so forth. And, and it's a complex environment and, and, and looking at, at the balance between those different things. Um, this is a pic, I, I, I'm very lucky to live in the countryside. So this, this kind of world is really on my doorstep. That, that tree there that you can see in the picture is called the owl tree in a, fe a field nearby me. I think it, it, it's kind of a good reflection of our countryside at its best, to be honest. Um, so the goal of the programme, um, and it's one of many big programmes in, in, in DEFRA, is all about how we make farming and the countryside much more sustainable as we move away from arrangements with the European Union, the common agricultural policy that we have at, at the moment. Um, its focus is really on supporting a thriving ag agricultural sector. It's about improving um, animal health and maintaining welfare standards of animals. And it's also about positive environmental and climate change outcomes. So big ticket, big ticket policy items there. Um, so from a kind of mapping perspective, a lot of complexity. Um, we know we're going to be successful when farming in the countryside are both economically, but also socially resilient and sustainable when farmers don't have the basic payments to rely on that they get at the moment. Um, it's also about making sure we have clean air, clean water, increased biodiversity and reduced waste. Um, and it's also about producing lower CO2 emissions and storing more carbon. Some of the, po the problems that we know we have to try and solve. So if you think about that, that value chain, it's about how do we make sure that we solve the problem of poor value for money that we have at the moment. So we, we a, a lot of money is um, given out as part of existing schemes, but not a lot of benefit coming back. Um, we, there's a problem around how we help those who manage the land to do that sustainably and give them the best support that they need. It's about avoiding the environmental damage that sometimes farming can cause. It's about better protecting animal health and welfare building trust that DEFRA as a government department has the systems and services to do that. Um, and they're not always trusted. So that there's some big challenges there for the pro programme to try and solve. 
And um, for us, mapping is really about how we can bring all of those different things together to have a roadmap to take us forward to do that. Um, so um, mapping and value chain mapping in particular is quite a new concept to DEFRA, but mapping specifically isn't new. And there's a number of ways that DEFRA is already using maps to help help with decision making, but providing all of that good data that Jackie talked about. So what you can see now is um, just an extract from, uh, it's called the magic system um, from Natural England, but it can show how the land um, is being used and wants to be improved. So um, it can, the, the DEFRA has been mapping and classifying agricultural land since 1966 from a very poor to excellent. And some of the, the, the data that goes into that is around the quality of the soil, for example. Um, so having this data and, and, and these kind of maps is something that as an organisation we're very used to. Um, this is also critical when we, we think about the goals that we have as a programme, because it, it's, it's the data and, and the visualisation that we can see here that we're, we're trying to change and trying to make a difference to have an impact on. Um, the other, that, so that's quite a, ma a, a, a macro view. A bit more micro is, that, is the maps that we um, ask farmers to create about the land that they manage and then they need to plan around. Um, this picture comes from something called the Land App, which is uh, not a DEFRA produced um, application. It's been independently produced that helps farmers to map the land they have and to be able to report on the activity that they're doing on that land. Um, so being able to say who you are, what you're doing, um, and where you're doing that is really important and tools like this are very familiar to, to, to farmers and land managers in England in terms of how, how they're able to share that information with DEFRA. The other kind of map that's really important to this programme is what we're calling a natural capital map. Um, this natural capital is really the elements of nature that directly or indirectly produce value to people. Um, it includes things like fresh water, land, minerals, the air, um, as well as other natural kind of processes and functions. And what this does is it helps us to kind of target where we can make the biggest difference, certainly in particularly to a kind of land, land, landscape scale, so that we can say, you know, we can start to identify, um, you know, including on specific farms, what, what are the big things that a farmer or a land manager or a group of farmers and land managers can do that will deliver the biggest benefit. So it helps us to coordinate that activity. And one, one of the parts of the programme is to really think about um, the value of that natural capital and how we can incentivise um, those who manage the land to, to, to carry out the kind of activity that can be paid for and deliver the outcomes that we're looking for. So um, DEFRA is an organisation that's really used to maps. Um, but is, le is less so less used to um, value chain mapping the kind of maps um, that we're talking about today. Um, so we, we, recently we've engaged with a company called Different um, to help us apply some of those mapping principles to actually how we de deliver this program. So not not just kind of from from the, the the land manager or the farmer perspective, but really how we can help to deliver. The, the technology, the data, the digital, the operations um, that are going to help us to achieve the goals of the program. So when we're working with with different to help us map all of that out. Um, we're looking at um, all of the products that are part of this program or the components, if you like, that would help somebody to either get or manage an environmental land management agreement to get or manage a grant to get advice or guidance um, about what they're doing on their land and also to get support in the transition because this is a big change. You can't underestimate the, the, the significance of the change for individual land managers and farmers and what they're gonna go through over the next few years. So our approach is really to, you know, this isn't gonna be no surprise to anybody I think on this call, but it's really about understanding where we are. Um, the, the, a lot of the value in the mapping is, is not in the map that you produce, but actually in the conversations that help you to produce it and in, the, in bringing people together to, to, to develop that consensus. Um, 
and understand where you are. So a big, uh, over the last two or three weeks, we've really been working with the different teams that we have in the program around those different product areas to understand the lie of the land now. What does the landscape look like? Um, what components and um, elements do we have um, that we're already using that we might be able to use into the future? Um, we've been doing that through two ways. We've had workshops with the people um, working on the programme, but we're also following up a, a lot with individuals. We've got a lot of uh, user research that we've done that's feeding into this. Other kinds of map around journey mapping that are fed into this as well um, to try and build that picture. Unless you know where you are now, you can't really predict your plan for the future. Um, and what we're hoping to do next is to really do that analysis and that ratification to understand where our challenges are and what we have now. So um, there's a number of different schemes that already exist uh, that have different interfaces with the user. There are different routes in, there are different ways of finding advice and guidance, for example, about different schemes. You know, that, that may be a bit fragmented. Um, there are elements of our, um, uh, our, our value chain, which are perhaps outdated and, and very bespoke they cost a lot of money to maintain um a lot of money to develop um and there are other there are other elements in there that are causing us a bit of pain um so getting that consensus really around what that that current landscape and that current picture looks like has been our focus over the next last couple of weeks so a bit of a glimpse um, uh, of what we've been doing. Uh, we've been using um, Google Jamboard. We've obviously been doing it all virtually. We've had between 20 and 30 people um, coming along to a whole range of workshops um, and getting them to contribute to this. So this is one of the first um, attempts we had at trying to map out uh, a grant. Um, so you'll see there at the top, there's the user or the farmer. Um, they rely a lot on advisors, they re rely a lot on, on guidance. Um, and going to, right down to the bottom, um, kind of furthest away from the user, the things that, the, that the kind of underpin this around rules and regulations and how eligibility is checked. Um, this was very much a first go, so this is not going to stay like this. There's, um, as I mentioned, we've had been having follow-up sessions to try and fill in some of the gaps and to ratify some of this. This is not a perfect description of how it works at the moment, but it's been a really good way to get that engagement um, as well as well as trying using mapping to really develop our roadmap for the future. We're using it as a way to build ways of working within our programme and to build consensus around what our plans are. Um, and doing and doing it this way has, has been a really good way to do that. Um, we have started to kind of ratify and draw out some of these value chains. So this is a very simplified version, actually, of that previous screen of how of how delivery of, the, of, of that grant is looking at the moment. Um, but as I say, it's very much a work in progress. So. Um, so, so I mentioned that DEFRA is, you know, Ma mapping in DEFRA is, is not something new, but actually um, Wardley mapping is, is something new. And somebody once said to me that actually doing Wardley stuff cold is a bit tough. Um, so what we've been doing as part of our current project is to really help uh, show how people how to map so that not only are we doing this exercise now, but that we can carry on doing that in the future and people within the organisations have the skill and the capability to do that mapping. Um, I think it's tough for a number of reasons that we're finding in government, you know, government is big and unwieldy and uncoordinated and has a lot of silos and actually the concept of, of, of mapping breaks all of that down so it's hard from that perspective it's something new it's quite a different way of working um there's always the question as well uh, of how this fits with everything else in a big program that you're doing you know what what's the purpose of mapping compared to other elements so we've had to work really hard to say this is how this fits in with all of the other elements of the program that are going on for example the business case um, reviews that are done by big government bodies because this is such an important program um, delivery model assessments and so forth so actually showing how wardly mapping fits into that and what the benefit is what the inputs to it are and what the outputs has been really important um, 
And as I kind of hinted at in my question for Jackie, I think one of the biggest challenges, and you'll have seen that from that kind of first screen of all of our post-it notes, is how you avoid getting distracted by the detail and being pulled down a rabbit hole and being able to, but, but having enough detail, detail to get the right kind of view. Um, so that's been particularly challenging, I'd say. Um, and as well as showing how people, uh, showing people how to map, we're trying to learn through this experience as well. So we're capturing a lot of feedback as we go along, tweaking our approach. Um, you know, it's not it's not kind of a one a, a one hit uh, wonder here. We're re we're really in it for the long haul. We want to use mapping as a way to help us navigate through this program over the long term. Um, and so, getting feedback from people, getting their input into that, and improving as we go along has been really important. So, oops, I skipped too quickly there. So um, just to say, you know, as I mentioned, we're right in the middle of this process at the moment. You've, you've caught us about three or four weeks in. Um, I believe uh, Dan from Different, who we're working with and is doing a great job of uh, showing our teams how to map and helping to make sense of our really complex products and program um, is helping us to do that. Um, ne the, the next thing for us is really to, to, to take um, th that understanding of where we are now um, and start to think about where we need to be so uh, this kind of sketch just shows you know how we might do that um, in terms of uh, having a sense of direction um, and momentum about where we want to take certain elements in our map different components so that we can actually have a really clear um, delivery roadmap um, for all of those elements in the program uh, so as you can probably tell this is this is quite a new thing for me and for the organization we're learning as we go along i'd be really interested to hear from other people what you've learned from mapping that you think might help us where we are now thanks very much wow fantastic um there's a couple of big themes which are coming out of, of the discussions today uh you, you've pretty much reiterated all of them one of them is it's not the map uh, but the the mapping the conversation, the process around it, that really, really matters. The second is about using the maps to challenge. Uh, so it, it almost gives permission to challenge ideas in a way that if it's all story led, it's very difficult to challenge. Uh, a third one is about planning for the future. That, that seems to be a, re, a repeating theme of learning lessons about the future. And the, and the fourth one was about inclusion including others uh, in the, this process. Now, I know we also had some questions on inclusion, uh, which were to Jackie, but I'm going to ask you both, actually. Um, um, this, because uh, Jackie talked about the shift from user needs to inclusion. Um, what's your, what have you experienced there? Um. <laughs> Yeah, so I, it's, it's been really important for us to be inclusive in this process. And, and one of the things that we, and Janet particularly, is a real advocate for is co-design, but co-design in the most genuine sense. So it, it's not just about kind of going out, finding out what needs, user needs are, and then, carry, and then bringing those back. It's actually about including people in how we design these services. They, they've been very challenging in the past. There's been a lot of criticism, I think, particularly for how the CAP was implemented in in England and so we really want to kind of learn the lessons from the past and make sure that what we deliver is workable for farmers that means we need to co-design with them mm -hmm. so from, from from that perspective you know we, we want it to be inclusive in that way so that people have a stake and a share in the change as it happens not just kind of you know somebody logging their needs and then doing it to them. Gosh yeah Jackie this was yeah, also what you would Jackie, you were also talking about this at, at the UN level as well. Yeah, I think the, the reason for me um, sort of uh, grasping this nettle was because the Industrial Internet of Things, the, we're talking about core services like cloud, we're talking about endpoints like a phone or a sensor or an actuator or something, and that the, the um, value chain is largely automated, particularly mm. when you're adding 6G, 8G in, all of those things, which is what we're talking about. And so you can't just abstract that and say human out of the loop. Well, you can if you believe in Industry 4.0, but I don't. <laughs> and so, so actually we have a situation in the UK now where 10% of our 
population are digitally excluded by challenge or choice. And that isn't likely to change. And with an aging population, it's likely to diverge. So the reason for the work in the accessibility directive in the EU was to actually understand how big the problem was. And we are largely missing on a user needs program, 80 million of our 500 million citizens. And that's because that approach was great, but that approach is over 10 years old now. And so we now need to say, well, you know, uh, we're in a situation where the, the baby boomers are going out of the workforce. They need different, um, they need different uh, programs and services. We have Generation Z and, 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 and Gen Alpha making their way into the workforce. We have to be able to shift the way we did things based on the citizens we serve. And the key thing I think that has gone with the change from user needs uh, through to an inclusion agenda is a, a complete focus on outcomes. Don't tell me what you're doing, tell me what you've changed. You need to have a baseline for change. You need to tell me what the change in outcomes is. So, so you know, we literally, the way we measure has changed as we've moved from user needs to inclusion. Okay, so that's, um, so when I wrote the Better for Less paper with Liam, oh, Liam, I was one of the lower co-authors, Mark Thompson and so forth. Um, there was a lot of emphasis about the user needs in there. And uh, there were several mistakes I made. One of them was not to include maps in that, um, because I was still thinking everybody knew how to map. They said, just here's my cheer, cheap and cheerful way. Government will have a better way of doing it. And I, I didn't discover until several years later, uh, a year or half later, it didn't. Um, um, but it's really interesting, um, you know, going back to what Tracy was saying, because um, it was all concentrated on user needs, because to be honest, it wasn't there. But it's yeah. more than that. Uh, once you start mapping with the end users, you start to discover what their actual needs actually are, other than rather than having this sort of assumption of what needs are. Is that what you're saying? It, that, that seems to be like a new practice. Um, or it feels like it's another change of practice. It, uh, am I yeah, getting so. that wrong? I, I think so. One, one of the things Janet has started to do is to kind of reach out across government to see who else is doing that. So we, we've started a bit of a Slack group and a kind of regular meetup, I think, to talk about code design in its truest sense, rather than just kind of gathering needs and acting on them, but actually to, to, to have that partnership. I, I think the other thing I'd really want to emphasise as well is I think... You know, in government, you know, we, we, we end up with lots of kind of legacy, whether that's technology or data or its process, actually. And I think one of the, the, the things that mapping is really helping us to do is to remember where we're starting from so that we have a plan for moving away from that. And we don't end up with just lots of systems that, that reinvent and do the same thing, but the old ones are still there. So we really, you know, part of our mapping is really about how do we move from where we are, recognise where we are, genuinely have, have consensus around that and, and, and move away from it to try and deliver the goals of the programme because, you know, achieving those goals and will be undermined if we, if we don't do something about where we are now, I think. Gotcha. Simon, did, did you want to jump in at all? Do you have any questions at this yeah, point? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I made a comment on the, on the side, I'm particularly... Um, because because there's lots of common there, there's there's so many as, uh, areas of crossover here um but one of the um interesting questions i just wanted to ask was was really about when you're introducing mapping to a new stakeholder typically a senior stakeholder saying so we're doing this mapping thing uh, how, how do you frame it to them uh, because certainly um part of the reason why i'm doing mapping is because it's useful but also so i can demonstrate the output and then you know explaining a map of somebody's own subject area is really helpful, I find, but you have to, have to do that work in advance. I just wondered if you've got any suggestions on that one. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we've, it, it's been difficult. I'll, I'll be really honest. It's been quite hard to to, to do that without, you know, so you, you kind of slip into a bit of jargon and people's eyes start to glaze over and think, oh, it's that techie thing that you do over there in the corner. It's not, not really for me. So I, I think actually having a program director who's done this before has been really helpful and she can talk about it in language you know and, and it's reinforced by others that this is you know this is not actually about technology it's about helping us to to join up our approach um to really get that consensus and to help us make decisions so i i, I think it's about building consensus around where we are and helping to make decisions and talking about it in language that doesn't slip into that jargon but also to show you know good point to good examples of um where it's been done before so um you know we, in in our kind of uh 
uh, show us showing you how to map session, which we've done with every group before we've actually done the mapping. Um, there's been some, you know, we've used, good, you know, the company have used really good materials there to kind of demonstrate other good examples where it's been done and, and to show the benefit and to, you know, um, to talk about it in those terms rather than, um, you know, as something niche. And I, I think I would say the same thing as well, Tracy. So, for example, in the G20, where we were looking at um, vertical farming to solve um, the problems in the world's largest city, which is Tokyo, we used some of the examples in Estonia. Estonia produces all its own food apart from sausages. So there's a long explanation of that. We really don't have time for it. But, but in order to say, well, this is how you could scale what you have, here's the example of Estonia using the common agricultural policy in order to move itself forward and be self-sufficient from a from a food security point of view. And in, in Japan, it would look like this. And so I, I think I've always built on existing practice and then when it wasn't there in the very beginning, created it. Um, and there's lots of willing volunteers who want to understand it because there's many people frustrated with how it is. And Tracy's got an ideal intervention because, because it's, a t it's an opportunity to rethink which is a huge opportunity, a really exciting opportunity to actually relook at the whole arena and then choose the interventions. And the thing that I would say that the senior st stakeholders say to me the most is it provides the focus. Because at the end of the day, if you've got to look at the health and well-being of 500 million citizens, you're going to have to choose some stuff and some stuff's yes. not going to get done. So actually what it does is allow you to create a consensual process on the focus you're going to lead with. So when you're going to sp spend 1.8 trillion euro, as we are, to do that intervention, how you spend it, the order in which you spend it, and in which way it gets allocated is massively important. And I think the clarity of mapping is what, is what provides that focus. So for the senior stakeholders, some, some assurance it's been done before and it's not some hokey thing you've invented with some more tech you've built, Jackie, but... Um, but actually, what does it do for me? And um, to be able to get a 1.8 trillion euro budget agreed in the commission is no small thing, but you can do it when you can actually give evidence as to why you would do it this way and, and, and how it builds across a seven year program, which is what we've had to do. And so mm -hmm. I think that they appreciate that because quite frankly, I'm, a, I'm from a long line of senchets, which is Celtic for storytellers. I'm a, I found co founded the data journalism industry. I tell stories all the time, but in this context, you need a map because you're spending that amount of money and you need to do it in the right way to build, to sort of, as I call it, layer the onion. Senior stakeholders want that confidence and another story isn't going to convince them, in my view. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. The, the, the only thing I'd add as well is that we have, you know, we have a lot of people in the organisation and outside it with, with some amazing knowledge and understanding about this whole area and about the people that we serve and about experience in the past. So mapping is a great way to bring those people together and to tap into that knowledge and expertise and to, you know, come out of that with something that you know gives us that evidence to, you know, influence ministers and make the right decisions for, well, in, in our case, spending a few billion, not quite as much as you Jackie but um you know a big pot of money so. it is but it's going to make a big difference to the UK and it's yeah. it's future food supply isn't it exactly. it's going to matter to all of us yeah well, we've all learned about how important understanding supply chains actually is more recently, um, something which has often been forgotten. So on that note, I, I'm going to take the ball and uh, throw it over to, to the police. Uh, Mr. Clifford Simon, it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, away with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just pull up my uh, screen. Uh, let me t is, it, is it showing? Do I have my presentation up? Yes, it is showing. Wonderful. Okay, so I already introduced myself, Simon Clifford, Digital Data. Uh, I'll uh, get uh, cracking then. Uh, and, and actually, that was a really good segue in terms of the usage of data and how you engage with stakeholders, because that absolutely chimes with um, what I've been uh, doing with uh, mapping. And certainly, um, my experience of mapping goes back probably seven eight years uh, picked up a, a map camp uh, from from my perspective it, it just clicked with me <laughs> um and i internalized it before i for a long time before i talked about it uh, to others 
uh, and again, possibly not realizing, you know, quite quite the uh, the goal that I had struck. Um, and, I, and I suppose I started talking to other people about it um, in a measured way, sort of four or five years ago. But certainly, <laughs> but certainly, anybody that's been to a meeting with me uh, in the last two or three years know I, I don't shut up about it. Um, and typically, it's one of the early qualifiers in any stakeholder conversation I'm having. You know, have you heard about water mapping? And if not, I'm going to tell you about it. Um, so, um, certainly, uh, f f from my perspective, um, I, 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 I work across all UK forces, um, and uh, I'm, I, I apply mapping to my th my thinking. It's just in my brain, um, and certainly the work I'm involved with uh, relates to both the national strategy, strategy around particular programmes. Um, I have a, a role in kind of rebooting the standards work that's happening in policing. Um, I support and, and, and uh, a number of national programs um, and uh, often I'm asked for ad hoc guidance around any particular area of capability uh, and one very close to my heart is that of innovation um, in this space. Um, and and I, I think just a bit of, you know, to, just if I may go, go to a little bit of context, you know, policing is in a has some really major challenges um, by virtue of just the power and exponential growth of technology um, and how criminality is quite adept to uh, using it. Um, the bottom line is, um, cr you know, crimes don't change that much, but the, the method of the crime absolutely does. And the force multiplier that the technology industry um, has brought us is absolutely being harnessed by criminality. And that is uh, a major um, threat to everyone um, at every level of society um, and certainly you know when, when you look at sort of conventional crime if you think about it in those, those terms uh, versus digital crime just the exponential scale of, 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 of threat and harm that an individual criminal can can do is just off the chart uh, and I think uh, you know we're all sitting probably most people mostly sitting at home um, on this call contributing to this event um, you know, working from home is very much uh, the way we're all doing things. And I wonder if that's uh, the way future crime will be the new norm for future crime. You know, ultimately, uh, you know, I think one of the largest bank heists happened a few years ago, $650 million uh, or pounds, of, you know, which decent chunk of cash in one heist across multiple banks simultaneously. You know, I did some basic maths on this. Uh, and if you had a really skilled uh, bank robber, not a good plan. It's, you're going to get you're going to get caught. You know, you don't have to sort of uh, rob a bank every day for 30 years to get away with the haul that one um, crime uh, hit, uh, which was albeit very, you know, um, Ocean's Eleven and orchestrated and planned. But ultimately, just the scale is just on a different le level. Some of the challenges we face around legislation are, are, are not insignificant. Um, the fact of, you know, legislation around burglary is mature and understood. Um, if we pull somewhere and they have equipment to burgle a house, we can pull them up for that. The challenge now, you pick somebody up with a phone and they have a whole bunch of technology that can um, that can maul a whole community, uh, thousands of people. The, the legislation is less clear, particularly when jurisdiction comes into the case. You know, if somebody is, is perpetrating a crime here to another country or multiple jurisdictions involved, and ultimately you don't have to be like some kind of movie techie uh, in this space. Um, bottom line is the, these are commodity uh, items, crimeware, skills and services uh, can all be um, obtained on the dark web. And then when we look at the really emerging technology that's coming through um, uh, around cyber, the pace of change is breathtaking, you know, deep fakes, you know, you know, pretending to be somebody else, voice changing software, all this kind of stuff. Anybody that saw the Google AI assistant from uh, demo from 2018, if you just take a little bit of imagination and think how if that was applied to criminality, well, th that is the challenge that we're trying to address. Um, these are whole new areas. It's pretty scary. However, you know, we, we, we do have plans, we are pulling it together, but we're also running a 24 seven emergency service. You know, ultimately, I think key areas to draw out in terms of some of the challenges we have is, is simply that exponential growth of data. Video is a major one, both in body worn video, CCTV submission to us. Uh, there's never been more evidence, there's never been more information, but actually trawling through it is massively challenging and the technology needs to keep pace with that. And ultimately keeping pace with that consumer technology that criminality is, is free to use. 
in addition to that, you know, we're uplifting our, our, our headcount, which is a fantastic thing, and there'll be much more digital native. Um, however, 20,000 uplift of um, warranted officers effectively is approximately 56,000 uh, new officers coming on our books with natural attrition and following austerity, you know, that in itself is, is challenging. Um, but ultimately, we do have strategies and plans around this and certainly uh, innovation in cloud. You know, anybody who uses a map where you get to that commodity space on the right, cloud is a key enabler and that's uh, an area that I'm working very closely on. And we do have a very, uh, very high quality uh, strategy that talks about how we're going to address these things and what we're going to focus on, which is really important. Um, and, you know, the headlines there are, are what we're covering and certainly enabling office and staff through digital. This was written pre-COVID, but absolutely our acceleration of uh, rolling out teams um, as a, a collaboration tool um, absolutely links and chimes with that. And this, you know, to talk to a couple of the other areas of seamless citizens experience, if you're working in Essex and you, you, you work in London, and live in Essex, the experience of policing should be constant and similar, but likewise, so should be the, should be the tools that our officers use, um, having a high expectation of what they can deliver and the pace of change uh, reflect the need of those technology systems. Uh, and I think one of the most important ones in, in that kind of areas of priorities is working with the private sector. Because ultimately, there's so much in the private sector that is 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 helping us address this, um, rather than having that public sector view of you know it, it's it's us and 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 you know private sector are our enemy to which try and just take all our money. Absolutely not. They're trying to work with us, working with some really uh, really highly skilled um, uh, people in great organisations, helping us address these problems. Uh, and I think that's an important area to have flagged in here. What I would talk about here is really about uh, where, where certainly mapping comes into my perspective. This is you know, some of those key enablers around that uh, overall strategy. But within that, I, I, you know, I'd draw people's attention to how, how important skills and culture are in that, um, as, as is ethics. And certainly from the you know, inside, uh, inside, I can talk to this, that ethics is a, is a really regular uh, point of conversation and concern that we're absolutely um, considering throughout our journey uh, in terms of evolving technology. We're always looking to do it ethically. And certainly that's how I'm, uh, I'm taking the mapping narrative, which I'll touch on a little bit, uh, bit more in a moment, in terms of the legislation ethics within maps. Um, obviously, it's the, the standard stuff in terms of complex environments. You know, we have 43 um, geographic forces and, and, and other forces and agencies to work with. But clearly, we're focusing on neighbourhood policing, we're focusing on investigation, um, safeguarding, etc. Um, but equally, it's not, not for, for lack of money. We're certainly spending a decent chunk of change, not the trillions that uh, we, <laughs> we just heard about. Uh, but policing, UK policing spends approximately one and a half billion pounds on technology a year. Um, and actually, when you compare that to the private sector, it's a little bit, um, it, it, it's not so favorable a comparison. Um, it, you know, even the highest percentage from private sector is sort of in banking securities and, and, and we're at, at current about, you know, just above 11% uh, of our spend on policing is on technology. And that's partly because of the way it happened and it's partly because of the disconnected nature. But we're recognizing it, we're identifying it and how we converge that, how we get back at, get, get over the hurdle of that um, previous architecture is part of the challenge we need to face. One of the things we've really uh, noticed in terms of as we apply maps um, is, is how, as you start to cluster the capabilities and areas to get together, how it, it lends itself to focusing on particular areas of the business. Frontline is what everybody thinks of and, uh, and perceives when they're outside of an organization. And that's what they see in policing. But clearly the management and back end is a, a key central part of that. And then ultimately delivering those cashable savings uh, is much more um, at the back office that often is clearly defined in that in, in the mapping um, evolution. Now we've been mapping through a number of stages and, and certainly I think it was mentioned before that this isn't some hokey pokey idea that I'm coming up with. You know, I might have the, the name Simon in common, um, but certainly it was incredibly helpful for me to, to reference um, the Boiling Frogs report that GCHQ does, uh, did a number of years ago. Um, that was a really helpful document for me to help bring the narrative that, you know, 
GCHQ have been using this around complex technology and using that to help segue the conversation in terms of my early doors uh, areas of mapping. And certainly we've already mapped some really interesting and diverse parts uh, of policing. Uh, and, and again, I see them very much as a snapshot, um, both a snapshot and also about framing a future perspective. Um, uh, as broad as sort of public contact through to counterterrorism. Um, but clearly policing has a whole bunch of capabilities and areas of focus. Um, and uh, we started working with policing in the private sector, helping us uh, deliver some of these mapping, work, working with workshops. Uh, Simon has been along and, and helped engage with some of the key stakeholders and spoken in a number of events. Um, but equally moving forward to that sort of decision support, around the pioneers, settlers, town planners narrative, you know, who should be doing the work. So not only advising a force how they can be most consistent uh, with their objectives through mapping, but also the areas that, strictly speaking, aren't their responsibility or, or they can't really get involved with because it's part of a national program, what their posture could be and helping inform them in terms of what their narrative should be within that space. Um, and equally, as we're moving forward with this, um, how this links into uh, multi-agency is a really key piece and, and absolutely this this next uh, six months is a very exciting time in some of the areas that we're looking at mapping and, and, and critically doing the links between the maps and, and certainly um, in the last sort of six months my conversations have evolved beyond uh, just policing um, and now whilst we work closely policing and home office we will start to engage with a, a number of other government departments but also external uh, organizations. So we're looking at the data flow to support uh, public protection because again, you know, whether it's cyber or, or online harm, um, abuse and those types of things, um, we really need to work together more effectively and certainly industrializing uh, mapping technology is absolutely key to that. Um, and that's certainly a strand of work that, that, that I'm taking forward, working with a number of partners in, in, in government, but also um, engaging with the private sector to help us with this because I do see the interoperability of maps as, as one of the really important areas because a, a mapping exercise right now is a snapshot of today that helps inform where your decision is decision making is going that can support papers and decision decision papers to go forward um, but equally how do we keep the, the dynamic maps live when we talk about 43 sovereign forces you know they all have live programs in in transit so identifying those unique nodes within multiple maps that are too far down the priority matrix of an individual force but can be identified as delivering enormous capability extension um, for uh, for a very focused timely activity that can propagate across lots of capability areas and that's certainly the ambition and again part and parcel of that is understanding who owns the data where the money's coming from uh, and linking it to different uh, areas of capability you know police forces do investigation but then all equally you know border forces uh, seeing people come in there's there's linkage from human slave uh, modern slavery to counterterrorism to a whole bunch of things and equally evolving maps um where we're not only capturing technology or process but we're looking at maps that apply technology process um, but also considerations around ethics jurisdictions and things like that and, and actually responsibilities in terms of funding and stakeholder engagement and following my kind of doom and gloom worldview you know there are examples where again it's almost like an unfair advantage when you've when you've got mapping in your back pocket you know projects where mapping has been used in the genesis and early stages as a project that i led uh, in my previous role in northamptonshire that is is now rolling out as a national capability mapping was instrumental in that it was a project that uh, is very much around focusing around the cyberspace in terms of protecting businesses and the public uh, in terms of creating a virtual alarm for cyber attacks so that evidence evidence can be captured dynamically and rapidly and, and put into um, um, policing whilst also geolocating the attacker to help us identify whether they're jurisdictionally uh, somebody that we can arrest or whether we need to pass it on to uh, colleagues in Europol or Interpol. And that's me done. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, um, wow. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things I will ask, because uh, actually there was a question I asked earlier, which was about whether mapping, the use of mapping, had ever changed any prototypes 
for uh, the, pro the process of prototyping that a, that a team had used. And it seems to be you're, you're, you're implying from that very last slide, that example, that, that mapping was instrumental in, in creating the prototype, the decision, which then eventually rolled out nationally. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's it's really the it's we, we use mapping in discovery. Um, so ju just simply, can we do it? Should we do it? Should we do it now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to to you you know to make and inform a decision quickly, mapping is the only technique. And, and certainly, one of the things I would say is you have to dispel, dispel a lot of people that are are drawn from a lot of previous best practice, that this is evolutionary, not revolutionary. This is complementary, that situational awareness piece. You know, we're, we're, we're taking process maps and then we're mapping them. Uh, ultimately, we're understanding where the maturity lies. So you can say, this is where, you know, force engagement should be happening as opposed to, you know, whether you should just outsource it. Because oftentimes you get this false, false premise that just because we've got developers in house, we just chuck them all the development and then they're that they've got too much work and actually they're doing development that you're better off outsourcing rather than doing the work that would really be meaningful. Oh, that the whole sort of let's outsource it all or let's do it in-house agile development do it all exactly. either of those bad choices generally if any complicated system of any scale uh, you always need a, an element of both. That, that's probably one of the things which makes me most unpopular at every conference because I keep on telling them what their method applies to the context not everywhere. So um so that, that leads me to the next question. Have you, where has mapping failed? Where have you used mapping? And I suppose, um, I opened it up to everyone. Um, where have you tried to use mapping and it just, uh, just didn't work. It was totally hopeless or sent you down the wrong path. Jackie, you don't have to raise your hand, just come off the mic and jump in. Um, so I'd say that it was my, um healthy discussion with Adrian Cockroft this morning about tooling because I feel that what tooling we use gets in our way and often in terms of the stakeholder engagement we're not able to see the immediate value because the tools themselves are not helping us create the maps effectively we're focused on the tool that's creating the map and not the map and I find that there's a frustration that develops. I see Tracy nodding and Simon there. And, and, and my healthy debate with Adrian this morning was, uh, he was talking about something that works like Keynote and PowerPoint. No, please don't give us 1987, 2003 technology. I explained Gen Z and Gen Alpha are a, a part of our future IoT workforce. We need something that actually um, gets their eyes on it. And you know, you talked about what we were doing 10 years ago, Simon, and, getting this out there but the reality was we didn't have a landscape but we do now and if we can get tooling that actually supports us I do believe more people would be able to do it because most people that I've worked with they don't want to do it because they don't think the tool they can't you know they're fiddling with the tool and not the thought process is being interrupted on the map and yes you can get people that are adept with the tools but I think unless we get tools democratized and in people's hands we'll keep it within our community that's not good so that's so, the barrier I see. So I'm, I'm going to use that as because then I'm going to throw it over to Simon, that particular yeah. question, uh, because uh, uh, you, you mentioned Adrian. For those of you who don't know, Adrian Cockcroft is one of the senior vice presidents at Amazon. And here's a completely gratuitous plug for AWS's second only ever book, Reaching Cloud v Velocity. Uh, and they even in this book, uh, I think it's page 50 odd. They have about 30 pages or 20, 20 to 30 pages of mapping in, in there. They even talk about the innovate leverage commoditized model. There it is, which they go using to wipe out industry after industry. And of course, they deny they do, but uh, it, 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 just brilliant stuff. So I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Amazon, AWS and et cetera. But anyway, tools for mapping. Simon, you've got a plan. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, absolutely, I do. So, so, um, and again, to, to put life into this, uh, and I think the analogy can be uh, really good around programming. Um, the way to start programmers and give somebody a, a, a programming suite and say, build, build some software, is to edit other people's software. Um, and that's the case with mapping. If you give people maps that they can start to orientate themselves around and start to modify, 
you literally that they're, they're mapping before they know it because they're, they're tweaking it and changing and saying well why is this here why is that there um but the wide the, the wider plan that we're looking to evolve is i've been engaged and, and reached out to some uh, very significant um, stakeholders of industry that are familiar with mapping uh, and there's a live conversation around that particularly around the focus area of uh, online harms which um, which includes areas like you know, child sexual exploitation, modern day slavery and things like that, um, but absolutely where we're looking to work with the private and public sector, but also multiple departments um, from NCA, Home Office, Policing, Borders, um, MOD, etc. Uh, because it's about understanding data flows and also where you're using technology to do the querying, you know, because ultimately there was a comment in one of the discussions about, you know, different levels of data and maturity. Ultimately, every node within a map is, an, is another map if, if you need to, it, it need to expose it. But equally, that, that node might not be within your, your estate. Yeah. Um, so that's why we need tooling that allows us to effectively connect that without necessarily seeing what's actually in that estate, because it, it might be privileged and frozen for very good reason. But ultimately, where it sits within the map is, is really important. So I'm doing some work uh, around that, looking to get sort of a minimum viable product off, off the ground that builds on some of the stuff that's been done so that it becomes much more sort of gooey, but importantly, allows us to connect maps. And so nodes can be connected and be informed uh, and we can industrially capture them. Um, because if once you start to really try and create a bunch of them, A, you want a quicker tool to do it with so it doesn't break the flow of a workshop, um, but B, so that we can actually see what each other are seeing because uh, frankly, between you know, government departments, absolutely there's transparency, but certainly around public protection, one of the things that opened my eyes to policing is how much you know, criminal investigation exists outside of policing uh, that we need to support. That is, uh, that is tooling between government and the private sector in order to, to create these maps. But you don't have to wait for the tooling anyway. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, throwing, bringing Tracy in here. I mean, you had post-it notes everywhere. And, and that seems to be pretty effective. Well, yeah, we used Google Jamboard, um, which does kind of, you know, it, as close as you can, given the current scenario, um, replicate that kind of idea of contribution so that everybody, you know, everybody can get on a Google Jamboard, create a post-it note and stick it up there. So it helps with that kind of participatory flavor. But I think, you know, we are going to move to Miro, 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 I never know how to say it. Miro, yeah. Because um, so, I think it has some... Um, some additional functionality certainly for some of the you know the complex complexity of the maps that we're going, going to be uh, potentially producing so um, I really liked what Jackie said about not starting from scratch I think you know th things that have got in the way of the success are um, you know that would be one is you know the idea that people feel they're starting from scratch from a blank page is quite challenging so having to, something that somebody can come along and tweak and 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 shift. Sorry, I think it was Simon that said that, not you, Jackie. And um, something that you can tweak and change is, is quite a good a good way to do it. But also, you don't want people to be you want people to think about what the benefit is, what what you're actually trying to achieve, rather than getting kind of tied up in the in the process or the approach. So being really clear about um, you know what what we are trying to get to here. What's the purpose? Why are we doing this? So I, I'm going to take that and throw that back at Simon. Well, well, yeah, I mean, cer certainly um, we've looked at all those maps and somebody's mentioning a comment about Wenvula, which again, we've looked at. The, the key thing I think is the ambition in terms of having industrial scale maps is, is every node to, to effectively dynamically link to another map if it exists. Um, and that map, map can be independently being modified, which will affect where the node sits. Uh, and also effectively creating a, a, a variant of a pivot table. So ultimately when you change the anchor, the map can reorientate itself. So, so I think those two key areas would allow us to have a situational picture, a 3D picture of mapping within really complex environments. Uh, and again, importantly, when you're talking about um, technology that's, that's working on behalf of law enforcement against criminality, uh, obviously the, the, the secret source in that needs to not be disclosed, um, but clearly where the connector applies to the private sector so they can help themselves be protected, uh, we need to create that mechanism. And again, so so we have a question for Christoph, which you may or may not want to answer. Um, <laughs> uh, do you also use maps to represent activities of criminals from their points of view, anchors, their needs, the way they will probably act? 
We're, we're starting to absolutely. We're, any user um, can be mapped. That's the that becomes the the anchor, and and absolutely it, it helps identify. It can help identify where their natural uh, tenancy is. The, the, the reality is, if, if if you actually deconstruct the the criminal process, you know we we capture evidence to find somebody to to put a case forward to the CPS Technics Court, and then tell them the evidence that we have, and arguably how we got that evidence, and then we stick them in a box for a few years. Uh, and they didn't try and figure out. A lot of them are not going to be, um, unfortunately, a number of them will not um, change their ways and will come out still being criminals, um, but they're going to try and tweak the mechanism. Uh, I'm often taken by the example of the, the great train robbery, um, that their techie was somebody who knew how to fix the lights on the, on the rail. And to take it from a red to a green, it was put a sock in front of the green and put it to a red light. But ultimately, it was the innovation that allowed them to do the crime. Gotcha. Now, now on that note, because I, I think we've only got a minute or a minute and a half left, uh, what I'm going to do is ask each of you to just give me uh, the one point, the one message, uh, or one or two, that people should really take away uh, from today's discussion on maps and government. And we'll, we'll go in uh, the same running order. So we'll, we'll start off with Jackie. So for me, it's um, it's 10 years on since we talked about sort of Wardley mapping and all of that. And that 10 year reboot is really what it's about. Uh, digital economy is here. We've made the efficiency gains, but we need to plan for a future digital economy that's underpinned by the industrial Internet of Things. And so that's why I say for most of us that are looking at mapping, we need to move from a perspective of user needs and look towards an inclusion agenda. Certainly, I mean, some of the chat have been going uh, great for everybody's questions. Thanks for all those, uh, particularly James. What I said to him was actually if what you do is, is you stick with user needs for now, but uh, direct it from an outcomes focused point of view, then you can you can move on to an inclusion agenda. But but realize that the future digital economies are not the ones that we're overseeing now. And I know there's still technical debt and everything else to consider but really forecast that future. Um, 180 economies are doing that. And, and so we all need a, as within this community to, to have that focus in our minds when we're doing the work that we do. Thank you, Jackie. Tracy. This is just summing up, Simon. I think yeah, a bit of one or two messages that you, know, you think everybody should leave with. Um, I, I think, you know, working in a, in a complex environment um, can be complexity at many levels, lots of different people involved. I, th I think mapping is, um, you know, the only way you're really going to try and bring those people together to get some consensus about where you are and to help you make some big decisions. Certainly where you're trying to bring forward change that has such a significant impact is, you know, a, a, a lot of tax payers pounds and um you know you want to achieve what you're setting out to achieve so you know it just it helps you to make sense of the complexity and navigate your way through it making the right decisions as much as possible driven by the evidence thank you uh, last but not least simon well, um, well, well, I, 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 I suppose this will, will, will mirror some of what's been said um I, I think it's about um decision sport making good decisions um uh, allowing decisions to be made quicker uh, that are underpinned by real uh, um, assurance that risk has been managed because you've identified the landscape. It brings in stakeholders that are otherwise baffled by the technology. So finance lead and, and executive leadership uh, who were previously um, not understanding the, the, the detail of the technology which was presented to them. So it's very much about business led change that it's un that's de-risked uh, through situational awareness. Super. And let's hope we can get that 11% figure down as well. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so at that note, I will say thank you all so much uh, for coming along and speaking about maps and government. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you here. I mean, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this and an hour and a half has just disappeared. Uh, just gone really quickly. Fascinating talks. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to the audience as well. And at that point, I'll say, see you next time. Thank you. Great. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks again, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.